Hi! Welcome to Strash Recap. Today I'm going to explain an action thriller movie called, Desperate Measures, which was released in the year 1998. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. The movie opens as two men visit the San Francisco FBI office late at night. A security guard soon stops them and asks for ID. One of them shows his badge, revealing that these men are local police officers, Frank Connor and Matthew James. They are thus allowed entry but the duo don't seem to be visiting on official duty. Instead, they break into a room reserved only for authorized personnel. Matthew then quickly sets up his own personal laptop and begins hacking into the FBI's system. They are looking for someone with a specific bone marrow for an unknown reason. Just then, their search is interrupted by a security guard who seems to be on his regular duty. But Frank sneaks up behind him and handcuffs him for no reason. After a few minutes of searching, they finally land on a man named Peter J. McCabe. However, he turns out to be a criminal with charges of murder, manslaughter, and assault. The next day, Officer Frank has a conversation about Peter with the police captain. It is revealed that the criminal is currently locked in solitary confinement for breaking an inmate's leg at Pelican Bay State Prison. Even though the guy has had no formal education past grade 9, his IQ is over 150. Moreover, he has escaped twice and killed two policemen in the process. The second time, he burned them alive and used their IDs to confuse the police. Peter McCabe is not just a fugitive. He is an extremely intelligent sociopath who loves to play with people's minds. Despite all the security hazards, the captain agrees to let Frank meet one-on-one -on -one with the criminal. The officer soon enters an interrogation room where Peter is tied to a chair. It is at this moment the reason for his visit is finally revealed. Turns out that Frank's 8-year-old son has leukemia. The boy desperately needs a bone marrow transplant or else he will die. After appealing for donors on TV for the past 6 months, Frank eventually decided to take the search in his own hands. He broke into the FBI office and looked through all the databases. The only person that matches the requirements for the transplant is Peter. Despite finding out that he can save a kid's life, the criminal has no intention of helping. He messes with Frank and makes him beg before saying he will think about it. The desperate father tries every trick in his playbook to change the criminal's mind. He even declares that his son is Peter's only way of redemption. However, it is obvious that a criminal like him doesn't seek redemption. All he wants is fun and freedom. Frank leaves the prison in desperation and goes to the hospital to meet his son, Max. There, he is met with more bad news as the female doctor reveals that Max only has a few more weeks to live without a bone marrow transplant. She asks Frank to prepare himself for the worst but the latter refuses to listen. It turns out that Max doesn't know that his cancer is back. He is excited about a new aviation book that his father gifted him and has no worries about the world. However, upon sensing his father's worry, the kid figures out something is wrong and inquires if he is going to die. Frank tells him about the cancer resurfacing but lies that he has found a donor willing to participate. The kid is joyous but also passes a heartfelt message to his father. Even if the surgery doesn't work, Max knows his dad did everything he could to help. Just then, Frank gets a call from the prison. Peter has finally agreed to the transplant but wants to meet Max before he confirms it. The officer is a little skeptical but he promises to bring the kid the next day. In the following scene, Peter and Max are together in an interrogation room. The criminal asks the kid to call him Uncle Pete and talks to him for a while. There is nothing malicious in the conversation and Peter even promises to be the kid's donor. But when Max runs to his father in excitement, the criminal comes up with a bunch of demands. He wants to get out of solitary confinement and be able to socialize with other inmates. He also wants his smoking privileges back, and he should be allowed to use the computer in the prison library. The warden is not cooperative enough to grant such demands at first, but after Frank pulls some strings, he eventually agrees. Shortly after, Peter is given a cigarette which prompts him to sign the consent form. The cops then leave him alone, and Peter begins the first step to his master escape plan. He ties his shoelace to his thumb and dislocates it. Meanwhile, Max is worried that he is going to receive bone marrow from a criminal like Peter. But his father asserts that receiving blood from an old person doesn't make you old. Likewise, Peter's sins have nothing to do with his body. In the prison, the psychotic criminal continues the preparations and approaches a secret drug supplier. The man doesn't want to do business with him but Peter threatens him to oblige. He wants an ampule of something called Narcan which is used to treat people who have overdosed. The supplier asks what he wants to use the drug for, to which Peter claims that everyone will know in time. Later, as the supplier works on getting his hands on the drug, Peter goes to the library. 
He uses the computer to study the map of the hospital where the transplant is supposed to take place. The clever criminal wants to intricately plan the escape route out of the hospital. When the guards check what he is doing, he pretends to play chess. Because he is extremely good at it, they never bat an eye. In the meantime, the police force prepares the hospital for Peter's arrival and ensures complete safety. There will be several helicopters flying above and an army will escort him to and back from the hospital. A night before the big day, the supplier gives Peter his daily dose of medicine, but he hands him two cups, one of which contains the Narcan he asked for. Once alone in his cell, Peter ties the ampule to a thread and the other end to his teeth. He then swallows the ampule to pull it out when he needs it. The day of the transplant finally comes and Peter is transported to the hospital by a large security convoy. He is taken to the OR in restraints, but they have to be removed when he is kept on the bed. The guards do not waste time before tying his hands again, unaware of his dislocated thumb. And as soon as the doctor sedates him to initiate the transplant, Peter drinks the contents of the ampule. This prevents him from passing out even after the anesthetics, leaving the doctors bewildered. By the time they catch up to his plan, he has already slipped his hands out of the bondage thanks to his broken thumb. He then uses a gas pipe that is inside the surgery room to attack the doctors and guards before making a run for it. Frank, who had been watching the commotion from the upper floor, runs to their aid. He helps them before turning his attention toward the fugitive. Peter slides down the laundry chute and wears a doctor's coat to disguise himself as one. Despite having a chain tying his legs together and a gunshot wound on his leg, the man is unfazed. He goes to a room and threatens a lab technician to break the chains using the hospital's laser guns. After that, he runs to the emergency room to get a shot of morphine for the pain, but Frank catches him in the act. At this intense moment, Peter holds a scalpel to the throat of Samantha, the doctor who is in charge of the transplant. He then demands that Frank give up the chase right now. The detective refuses and tries to shoot, but Samantha reveals that if Peter dies, the bone marrow will be useless. This means that Max will never get the transplant. As Frank contemplates what to do, a policeman named Wilson appears from behind a curtain. He points his gun at Peter, asking him to let the doctor go. In a moment of panic, Frank gives up his gun to Peter so he can defend himself. The act ensures his departure from the police force, but all he cares about is saving his son. Soon, the place erupts into a shootout which ends with Peter killing another policeman and hurting Wilson gravely before running away. When the captain arrives with his team, he berates Frank for letting people get killed for his son's life. Frank is then arrested for his erratic behavior and is to be sent to the police station. However, when they are outside the hospital, he throws the policeman into a crowd of reporters and escapes. Back inside, Max bleeds from his nose and Dr. Samantha is tending to him. Officer Matthew is also with the two but he's soon attacked and knocked out by Peter. The criminal then threatens Samantha to reveal where the cyclopropane is kept in the hospital. He also promises Max that he will send her back as soon as she helps him find what he wants. Meanwhile, Frank arrives at the hospital and goes straight to his son to check if he's okay. He also helps Matthew and learns that the fugitive was talking about propane. This gives him an idea of where Peter might have gone. Frank then instructs Matthew to take care of the kid before heading outside. Elsewhere, Peter makes Samantha put two tanks of propane into a bag and asks for directions to the electrical room. He is planning to blow up the place as a distraction to escape without getting caught. However, Samantha takes him by surprise and hurts him before running away. She then meets Frank in the hallways and the two engage in a short conversation. The desperate father begs her not to tell the police about Peter's whereabouts as he will surely get killed. Samantha is a bit hesitant but she eventually agrees and goes to tend to Max. Shortly after, the two men meet outside the room with propane but Peter has an upper hand because Frank cannot kill him. He then blows up the room and runs away yet again. The explosion also causes the entire electrical system of the hospital to shut down, including the ventilators and the lights. As a result, Matthew moves Max to the old building of the hospital which is joined through a bridge. While trying to follow them, Frank notices that Peter is also moving to the same building. As he crosses the bridge, the cops start firing at the criminal, but Frank saves his life by shooting at the light they are using to locate him. Shortly after, the SWAT team enters the hospital which means Peter doesn't have long before he is either caught or killed. To gain leverage over the guards, he holds their team leader hostage. This allows him access to the control room which he uses to put the entire hospital in lockdown by closing all the doors. Meanwhile, Samantha is told that the kid is in desperate need of a doctor and she needs to be in the old building as soon as possible. When Frank learns of this, he takes immediate action. He hides Samantha from everyone and gets her to the other building. This act of heroism gains him appreciation from even Peter who is watching them on CCTV cameras. 
After being let inside, Frank and Samantha go to see Max while Peter plays out the next part of his plan. He brings the hostages on the roof as a distraction, knowing that the captain and his team will be on the bridge joining the buildings. He has laid a tank of propane near the bridge to kill them. But Frank figures out his plan and saves the captain and his team's lives by blasting the propane when they are not on the bridge. Now, the only people in the building are Peter, Frank, Matthew, Max, and Samantha. The latter three are inside a locked room while the other two are outside. Peter approaches Frank and threatens to kill him, but Max quickly opens the door to save his father. In the process however, he ends up being held at gunpoint. Peter then acts out the last part of his plan and uses the kid as a hostage. They go to the morgue which has a way to the tunnels underground. This was Peter's original escape plan all along as he had acquired the map of the tunnel from the internet. He then makes a hole in the wall and apologizes to the kid. Peter says that he would have helped if he were not in such a dire situation. After this, he leaves the kid there and runs through the tunnel. But Frank soon learns about Peter's plan and finds him driving away in a blue truck. He then steals a police car and uses the cop's ID to ask for help from the control room. After driving for several minutes, Frank finally sees the car about to get on a bridge. This gives him an idea and he contacts the bridge operator through the police car's intercom system. In the meantime, the news of the criminal trying to flee in a blue truck reaches the Capitan. He quickly gets into a search helicopter along with a police sniper. They are headed towards the same bridge where all the action is happening. On the other hand, Peter realizes he is being followed and accelerates his vehicle. But to his dismay, the operator has already locked all the exits. After playing the cat and mouse chase for so long, Frank finally traps the criminal on the bridge. Peter still has the gun he stole from a police officer earlier. But before they can come to loggerheads, the helicopter carrying the captain and the sniper appears near the bridge. Peter uses this opportunity to create chaos and shoots at the helicopter. The sniper takes his rifle out and fires back in response. However, Frank jumps in front of Peter and takes the bullet on the arm to save him. This gives the criminal the perfect chance to run away and he tries to jump off the bridge. But a desperate Frank shoots him on the leg, causing him to fall into the river below. With his remaining strength, the officer then jumps into the water and saves Peter just in time. In the aftermath of this face-off, an injured Peter is transported back to the hospital. He knows that he may very well succumb to his injuries and finally agrees to the transplant. At the hospital, Samantha heads the complex surgery. They take out the necessary stem cells from Peter's spinal cord and transplant it to Max. Fortunately, the whole operation is a success and the little boy gets his life back. On the other hand, Peter has a more difficult road to recovery. He is kept inside a glass box in the hospital, is guarded by a police officer around the clock. One day, after the routine checkup, Peter calls in the officer. The criminal seems to be struggling and can barely talk. He gestures at the officer to lean in close and asks how Max is doing. The latter obliges and reveals that the kid is doing fine. Surprisingly, as the two engage in conversation, Peter steals the officer's gun. The movie ends as he asks the cop what kind of car he drives. This is my explanation for the movie, Desperate Measures. So what do you guys think about the movie? Write in the comment. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.